Mildred. She's a hummingbird. What kind? Well, we'll get into that in a little bit. She's been hanging out in my backyard for three or four years now. While playing with the grandkids in the backyard, I noticed that she was hovering around the teddy bear cactus. A very interesting choice indeed. Upon further review, Mildred had built a nest. As you can see, she sat proudly atop her masterpiece, made from feathers, dandelion fuzz, spiderwebs, leaves, and bark. It was immediately obvious to me that the old gal was warming and protecting eggs that she must have recently laid. Hummingbirds do not start incubating till the second, sometimes third, egg is laid. And they do this so that they hatch at the same time. Hummingbirds normally build their nests 10 feet or more above the ground. This was quite an opportunity. Finally, she made a mad dash for my Sega palm, where she would gather some spider webs to do a little patchwork. This was my chance. And there they were, two eggs. One with a conspicuous band around it. How exciting. And out of that banded egg came Marty. March 22nd, 2019. We waited all week to see a beak poke through that second navy bean sized egg, but it just didn't happen. We had to wait one more day for Mia to make her appearance. And so she did. She will forever be one day younger than Marty. Mom's work is far from done. She's already spent a couple weeks building the nest, a couple more weeks incubating the eggs. Now she's going to have to feed and warm the babies for three weeks just to have another week to teach them how to do all that on their own. As you can see, it's a bit windy, but mom placed the nest in a very smart location where the only wind that would be detrimental would have been a direct easterly wind, which is very rare. Here you see Mildred finding a seat on top of her kitty winkies who measure at best one inch. She'll be doing this until they get their feathers. So what's on the menu for Marty and Mia? Well, at this stage, it's mainly protein, which means soft bugs like gnats and ants. Mom will lap these critters up wherever she can find them. Then it's a quick stop at the flower shop for a bit of calories. Mom's tongue moves in and out at 13 licks per second. That's right, hummingbirds lick, they don't suck. She promptly delivers the goods, which are stored in what's called a crop. This is an organ that starts the digestive process but allows the bird to accumulate food for a later time. In this case, that later time is now. You may be asking yourself, how is she shoving that long beak in that short body? It's like a square peg in a round hole. It's like a two inch needle in a one inch sack. Well, the answer is, I don't know. In any event, they seem to be okay with it. It's not really like they have much of a choice. The flight of a hummingbird is something to behold for sure. As you probably know, they can hover, they can fly pretty much any direction, up, down, backwards, forwards, sideways. In fact, they're the only bird that can fly both forward and backwards. You may have noticed Mildred flying backwards when she was visiting the flower. Here you see Marty calling for mom. So back to the fun facts covering the maneuverability of this fascinating family of birds. Did you know a hummingbird's wings will beat about 70 times per second? And if they're actually in a dive, it could be up to 200 times per second? They can fly an average of 25 to 30 miles per hour, and when they're doing that dive, up to 60 miles per hour. And I gotta believe their acceleration rate, zero to max, is unprecedented. Mildred looks a little too comfy to fly right now, but tomorrow's another day. noticed that no males have made it into the script yet. Well that's because dad did what dads do in the hummingbird world. After a little bit of courtship and copulation, daddy's gone. He doesn't even help build the nest. In fact, if mom did see him, she would most likely chase him away, 
Many believe that's because their bright colors could attract predators. The issue is, without seeing dad, mom can be a little difficult to identify. Female hummingbirds look a lot alike. So let's take a look at some of these male versions and see if we can narrow the list. The ruby-throated hummingbird is very rare in the West, and the broad-tailed hummingbird, not pictured here, has a conspicuous orange area on its side. Here we see a male and his hummingbird. The female looks a whole lot like Mildred, but is also quite a bit larger. So we can knock these three off the list. That leaves two more possibilities. The Costas hummingbird? or the black-chinned hummingbird. The female version of these two can be very hard to tell apart, so I decided to call an audible. That's right, I'm gonna let their voice be my guide. After carefully listening to samples of the black-chinned hummingbird, and the Costa's hummingbird, I was 95% sure we were dealing with a Costa's hummingbird. But when I found this sample on the internet, I was positive that that was the same sound I heard from Mildred when she flew over to the oleanders next door. So there you have it. The hummingbird in my backyard in Henderson, Nevada is a Costa's hummingbird, named after the Frenchman Luis Costa. And if that is not the correct pronunciation, I apologize. So who is Marty and Mia's dad? Is it Melvin? Manny? Mark? Miguel? Or perhaps someone my camera has never met? That would be my guess. The second week would be comparable to our elementary school years, being the middle portion of their growing period. In this period, Marty and Mia will go from their birthday suit to their first set of clothes, bare skin naked to a coat of feathers. Early in the week, mom would feed her kids like normal and continue to sit on the nest when she was done to keep them warm. Her time away from the nest was minimal. She would leave the nest long enough to gather nutrients and return to the nest with very little dilly-dally. Here you see Marty and Mia on day 13 cuddling up and looking cozy. Now with their feathers in, mom can leave the nest for a longer period of time. The kids also seem a little more impatient as they poke at mom. Fine, let's speed this up. Woo, that was fast. Something else different towards the end of week two, I could start picking out differences between Marty and Mia. Can you tell who's who? I promise it will be obvious next week. I also noticed mom increased the percentage of nectar in the kids diet. That means more visits to the flowers. With more time on her wings and less time spent on the nest, Mildred enjoys a moment up in the neighbor's ash tree. And here, her longtime favorite, the top of my Craig Myrtle. And now, her new favorite, up high, directly above the nest, on a dead cedar branch. She'll spend a lot of time here, keeping her kids clear of danger. Sparrow posed no threat to Mildred and her family. 
Several visitors could have under the right circumstances. Her placement of the nest in this cactus eliminated a lot of the potential hazards coming from snakes, lizards, larger birds. Even the neighbor cat would surely think twice before getting a pawful of thorns just at an attempt at such a small meal. Let's take a look at some of the critters that could have posed a threat that Mildred was sharing or potentially sharing the backyard with. So I think you get the picture. Short of stealing Mildred's favorite perch for a moment, this house finch posed no threat. However, a bird similar in size did. Mildred was forced to chase the birds away several times as they landed on the cactus next to the nest. I immediately wondered if these were the same birds that I photographed in this very same choya two springs ago. I assumed back then they were nesting there. Could that be their interest again? The purpose of these Verdon's visit will be very clear a little later in this film. Things really started heating up in week three. The kids got cute, they started separating themselves from each other, a little bad behavior, lots of basic flight training, and we'll get into all of that. Here you see mom feeding the kids early in the third trimester. Notice her enlarged crop in this particular video. Before we talk about all the cute and cuddly stuff, let's talk about poop. As we watch Mildred feed her kids a couple days following the previous clip, we also see lots of round hummingbird waste sitting on the edge of the nest. In fact, we probably noticed that throughout the movie. Surprisingly, she doesn't need to teach them how to keep from filling their own home up with their own nasty filth. They back up and let it go, and that's why you see it on the edge of the nest. As her diet consists more and more from the fruits of the flowers and the hummingbird feeders, the consistency of what goes out has started to match what went in. So close your eyes or look away for a moment as Marty demonstrates. And the coast is clear. And that'll do it for the gross stuff. Well, maybe not quite just yet. I did say I was going to prove that mom is feeding the kids ants. So as she regurgitates, if you wait for it, there it is, an ant. Marty and Mia began preening in week three. Preening is an important function that improves the condition of the feathers and prepares them for flight. They do this by removing oil with their beak and spreading it throughout. They use their feet to spread that oil to their neck and head area.
There were a couple days where mom sat or attempted to sit on the nest quite frequently. Now whether that was due to the wind or she needed a little rest, that's hard to say. But when your heart beats at 250 beats per minute, or five times that in activity, well, a break makes a lot of sense. Practicing or flight training is a very important component into the baby hummingbirds learning how to fly. Here you see Marty trying it for the first time. Here we see Mia in her first attempt, which happens to be a day after Marty, which makes sense in their development. Marty and Mia would practice over the next four or five days, grabbing onto whatever they can with those little feet and exercising those muscles. Here we see Marty lose grip and fly right off the nest. Don't worry, he got right back on. It became very easy to tell Marty and Mia apart come week three. In all three of these examples, Mia's on the left and Marty's on the right. It wasn't just appearance that changed, it was also behaviors. In this case, Mia started acting up a bit. Here you see Mia literally push Marty out of the nest. You could say it was an accident, but then why did she immediately dig into the area that Marty vacated? If you look closely here, she's actually snapping at Marty's tongue. And here, she gives him a couple headbutts. In this case, Marty retaliates. Mia's behavior was noticed by more than just Marty. Mom was getting just a little bit fed up as well. She would refuse to eat at times, and Mom was not gonna put up with that. You will eventually see her literally lift up and execute a couple body slams. been wondering how I've been gathering this footage without interfering with Mildred and the family. Here you see the Nikon 2 to 500 millimeter zoom and the D7200 camera. With the use of binoculars from a little farther away, I'm able to move in and hit record without causing undue stress. Hummingbird nests are built to stretch. Despite the webs of soft material, help the nest grow with the babies. Here we see mom trying to make a little repair. We also see that she's stealing some of that material and taking it somewhere else. Mildred is building another nest.
So I mentioned that Marty and Mia started taking on different characteristics, one of them being their markings. Marty had basically a light beige color on the throat and chest area with some light brown streaking on the throat. While Mia had basically a dark grayish five o'clock shadow, if you will, and an overall whiter look. If I were to jump to conclusions, I would say that Marty's looking more like a girl and Mia is looking more like a boy. I contacted four different experts on the subject of whether you can tell the gender of a hummingbird at basically three or four weeks old and I got mixed answers from possibly to probably not. So it may be a little hasty to say I got it backwards. Besides, names are names and Marty will always be Marty and Mia, forever Mia. Day 24 marks a very special day. Here we see Marty receiving his last meal in the nest. Luckily I set my alarm clock, for this occurred at the crack of dawn. Don't let the camera's wide open aperture fool you. Marty appears very alert. What's he looking at? Is he searching for a branch in which to land? Is he following mom's movement? There he goes, leaving his one day younger sister to wonder what just happened. Marty landed in the nearby oleanders, and it didn't take mom long to find him and continue with the feedings. Mia did not immediately follow Marty. In fact, she seemed to be a little moody, refusing meals from mom on more than one occasion. With the children in two different places, Mildred selected new vantage points. Whether due to her stubborn nature or the fact that she's one day younger, Mia spent much of the day in the nest, practicing. Mom got accustomed to poking and prodding at Mia to get her to eat. In this case, it resulted in a feather, which now became part of Mia's meal. Marty finds different branches, but stays in the oleanders. I was beginning to worry that Mia was going to spend another night in the nest. This may have caused an awkward situation for Mom. Even though the nights are warm enough where Mom won't go into torpor, which is a mini hibernation where the body's metabolism slows way down to conserve energy. You'd think she'd feel better if Mia got out of the nest before sundown. She's looking awfully alert. Could this be it? Come on, Mia. It's been almost 10 hours. Bingo. Mia chose the oleanders as well, finding a nice, clear, open area. And in no time at all, Mom joined her.
Mom began tearing the nest apart, stealing material. She's obviously going to have another run at this. In fact, every time she took some material from the nest, including when the babies were still on it, she headed in a different, but always the same direction. The Virgins returned several times after Marty and Mia left and Mom no longer chased them away. And now their intent is clear. They want the needles. They make excellent fasteners for their nest. Marty and Mia chose different trees to perch in during this all-important learning period where mom continues to feed them but expects them to watch and pick up some pointers and eventually do it on their own. Marty chose the dead cedar branch directly above the nest. And Mia opted for a little more cover in the Craig Myrtle. Here we see mom and Mia in the tree. Notice how Mia actually looks larger than Mom. Is that due to the fluffed out feathers? Or do they lose a little bit of weight after they get on their own and burn more calories? And here's Marty taking his turn. Mia took to the flowers quite quickly in week four, while Marty, on the other hand, I'm guessing, shows a flower in someone else's backyard. Marty tries to lick up a few bugs. And Mia attempts the same. Mia has also learned that you can find small bugs at the flowers. While well, mom gets a little me time in the neighbor's tree, Mia flies off to get a little nectar and exercise. Marty takes advantage of this opportunity and flies over to the Craig Myrtle. He would share the tree with his sister for the next couple days. Towards the end of the week, Mom would fly in from time to time and deny them a meal. Mia doesn't like that. Here's a satisfying yawn after a good meal. Here's a sleeker looking Mia. Mia takes in a little nectar at the flowers. Unknown to her at this very moment, Marty is watching and has plans. Marty's gonna take off and play a little cat and mouse with Mia. As they zip around at each other, Mia decides to land on the ground. This wasn't the last time either. Hummingbirds are very vulnerable on the ground, so I hope Mia breaks this habit. Here we see Mia in a jealous rage. Looks like she got her way. As you can see, Marty's right next to her on the branch. And it doesn't look like he's very happy he didn't get fed. Let's close week four out with a few still shots. Day 31 would be the last day of childhood for Marty. One month is a very short time to go from egg to on your own, but that's life in the hummingbird world. While Mia's development seemed to be one day behind all the way through, this would be the one exception. This would also be her last day of dependency. Marty and Mia spent a pretty good portion of the last day close. They could have perched anywhere, but it seemed that they preferred to socialize. That's not to say they always got along. Marty seemed to pick on Mia a bit. Perhaps a little payback for getting pushed off the nest? Marty messes with Mia one last time. 
or is he actually telling her, hey, it's time to go? Siblings have been known to stick together in close proximity and socialize for up to a year. Marty flies off into the sunset. And Mia eventually follows. Since lots of people confuse the hummingbird moth with an actual hummingbird, I wanted to collect some footage to include in this documentary. Well, lo and behold, I had another visitor on the very same flower. I had given up hope of ever seeing the kids again, but to my surprise, Mia appeared. And looking at the darker markings that Mia is now sporting, she's looking more and more like a boy. If nothing else, a tomboy. She also appeared a couple more times on different days. This makes sense since she was the one that actually liked the flowers in my yard. Mildred shows up from time to time as well. I even took a walk in the neighborhood and found where she's nesting. And that just leaves Marty. I haven't seen him yet, but I'll keep my eyes open. Just shy of two months since the hatching, Mom, or who I assumed was Mom, returned to her old favorite perch. At the same time, a male landed in the lower limb of the Craig Myrtle. This is the same limb that probably the same male landed in shortly after Marty and Mia left the nest. Though it was getting dark, this time I got a picture. Now, it's important to understand, male hummingbirds during mating season seek and protect about a quarter acre of non-overlapping territory. Since this male allowed Mildred to nest in this territory, that being my backyard, this is Marty and Mia's dad. Let's get back to the other bird in the yard. Upon closer observation, this wasn't mom at all, nor was it Mia. As you study this specimen hovering above the grass, you can see a couple black spots with a little bit of purple tint. Now this doesn't mean it's a male or a female, but it does mean it could be Marty. At this point, Marty's beak would have already reached its full length. However, Though, for the longest time, I could have picked these kids out of a lineup, the sad truth is, from this point on, the only way I'd know for sure is through another hummingbird's eyes. <laughs>